good evening friends in this event of uh, reading up we are going to have this discussion on raja raja chola by kamni dandabani book has been published by alif and after the event if you are picking up a copy you can get the author to autograph it uh, for the copy is available here and now why this book there is so much of discussion about raja raja chola and most of the entry point has been fiction people come to raja raja chola either to the film or through kalkis uh, in selvan for us to look at raja raja chola from a different lens which is not the film or it's not kalki itself is a interesting opening and as a journalist for me the key aspect is any work has two trajectories one is bearing witness or other one is to make sense a history book is an attempt where you use secondary sources of bearing witness to make sense and when you're using secondary sources to make sense what are the filters you use to trust your sources these are the questions which come to my mind and hence for me this book is so central because we also have this young research scholars with us therefore we would like to start with the process you follow to do this book okay thank you first of all thank you for inviting me here the process was very very difficult and in some ways i was telling you earlier i have come full circle my research actually began right here at this library mrs ramani natarajan was very kind to put me in touch with the mr sundar and in the early days i had absolutely no idea so my mandate was to write a layman's history of the cholas and before i carry on about the research process i want to ask all of you two questions how many of you here have heard these names babar Humayun, Akbar, Jahangir, Shah Jahan, Aurangzeb. Okay, how many of you have heard these names? Vijayalaya, Aditya, Parantaka, Gandara Aditya, Arunjaya, Sundara, Uttama. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, that's great to know that. And this kind of response will probably happen only in this room because in our school histories we were all taught much more about the moguls and barely anything about the chola so the second set of names i gave you were all the names of chola emperors until raja raja chola so there is a lot of academic research that covers the cholas but very little that is so you have two extremes one is very academic stuff that is very boring very dense very deeply scholarly and that is of interest only to an academic community and then you have the pony and selvan type stuff which is historical fiction which is like you know there's a bare coating of history over wild imagination so my job was to delve into the research i have not read pony and selvan at all i deliberately did not read it because i didn't want that to kind of uh, 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 control my thinking or uh, you know mar my thinking in any way and i really did not know where to start i know some of you are history uh, are scholars phd scholars here embarking on your own research projects and research is not easy so you just you go down numerous dead ends numerous rabbit holes you just read that's what i did i just read and read and read and read my foundation stone was a book called the cholas by nilakanta shastri but that's about 80 years old and there is a lot of very specialized research on different aspects of chola life for instance just the military camp pains or just the brihadeshwara temple or just um, the bronzes or just the trade or just the organization and they're incredibly detailed and incredibly dense and incredibly boring but you have to go through all that come up for air and then kind of sit back and look at the big picture in all this so that's that's what i did and um 
you will find there's a lot of disagreement. You know, one set of scholars will say one thing, one set of scholars will say another thing, another thing. And I'm not a historian, so most of my research was secondary in nature. I did no primary research other than to actually visit Tanjavur and some of the places, but everything else was reading what others had to say and try and make my own interpretations of things or also just put everything out there. This one person said this, another person said quite the opposite. And then just, you know, we don't know the truth at this point. The truth could be one or the other or neither or both. Um, so you have to have an open mind about what you're reading. And also, you know, the Cholas were master inscribers. They wrote a lot of stuff about themselves on the temple walls that needs to be taken with a hefty dose of salt because their primary purpose, their purpose was, yes, to record their history and talk about what went on, but it was also to aggrandize themselves and make them out to be these great people. After all, they were ruling territories they had never ruled over before. They were controlling people who had not been under their control before. And they had to find a way to make that acceptable and so something that those people could stomach. And one way to do it was to say that you are under this grand king who was descended from the sun and Lord Rama and all these great ancestors. And now you are part of this thing. So you need to look at the inscriptions that way, you do not take them literally, but you also step back and wonder why did they say these kind of things? Why are they talking about themselves like that? So it was a learning process for me. I didn't know any of this when I set out, but eventually, you know, kind of a picture emerges. And for anybody embarking on research, you just have to, you know, a lot of spade work has to be done before you finally start seeing the big picture. So don't give up on that. One thing which is fascinating is, while the book has such a huge canvas, it also has micro detailing of the personality. How did you work on this micro detailing of the person? Again, it's a lot of reading between the lines. For instance, Raja Raja Chola, he was quite a few emperors down in what we like to call the imperial Chola line. He came to power after immense, you know, struggles and there was tremendous instability and he kind of clawed his way through a bunch of battles and finally amassed a kingdom that was bigger than any, you know, South Indian kingdom had been up to that point. And then he built this Brihadishwara temple, the likes of which had never been seen in the land before. It, the Chola temples until that point were small, like, you know, two-story structures, little stone buildings, all built in villages with strong religious associations. So the Cholas came to power soon after what we call the Bhakti movement and the Nayanmas and Arvas who had been there a century or two before that had through singing songs and telling poetry in the villages of the Kaveri Delta, anointed those villages with a very deep religious significance. Now, Raja Raja comes along, he has his capital in Tanjavur, and he builds this absolute colossus of a temple that is huge. It's like 250 feet, 15 feet high, the Vimanam, on a scale that has never been seen before, and in a place with absolutely no prior religious association. There was no uh, Nayanmar or Shah Arvar who had written like that about Tanjavur. So in doing that, he... Uh, kind of created a grand symbol of uh, a unifying symbol for his empire. So it did not mean more to one set of people and less to another set of people. So I think that gives you an insight into the mind of Raja Raja that he was a strategic thinker, okay? It, you, it, to say that he built this only out of uh, religious uh, devotion is to kind of shrink, minimize his uh, uh, what he was about. Yes, I'm sure there's a great deal of devotion that was behind it, but there's also very canny strategic thinking. And this is what I talk about, like reading between the lines. I could be all wrong, but I do feel that that was a big motive behind Raja Raja building a temple like that. He drew the whole kingdom into the workings of his temple. So they felt invested in it. You know, there's a great deal of prestige in donating to the temple, in being a part of its ritual life in um uh, yeah in being associated with the temple in in one of many 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 ways so uh, again he kind of got a sense of unification that you belong to this bigger whole by building that temple 
And then another case in point about an interesting personality was Rajaraja's son, Rajendra. Now, as I just said, Rajaraja poured money, like war booty and, and, and the revenues from villages from all over his kingdom into building the Brihadishwara temple. And it was a gargantuan enterprise. It was like this massive corporation, you know, the, the building it is what was one thing. Running that temple took tremendous, you know, organization and infrastructure and everything like that. He had just about finished it when he died and his son Rajendra became the king. And you would think that Rajendra has always been portrayed as his very nice, dutiful son, dutiful to his father and his memory, that he would probably continue his father's legacy. But no, he just almost like swept it aside, built his own temple Ganga in Ganga Konda Cholapuram, made that the capital of the Chola empire, drew all the villages that had been um, contributing revenues to the Brihadishwara temple were now diverted to contributing it to his uh, Gange Kunda Cholapuram people, uh, temple. So what was the thinking behind that? It's interesting. He's not just some sort of a quiet, dutiful son, but somebody who wants to establish himself. He had very big shoes to fill and he was determined to fill that and, and more, you know. So these are the interesting psychological insights that I thought, I, mean, I, I could be totally wrong, but I just felt that it's a far more interesting story than just a father and a dutiful son and nothing more. You know, those are caricatures. More than father and son, the way you portray the women in this book is fascinating, especially aunt. Yes. How did you manage to cull out those details about the aunt? Again, through so most of information about the Cholas is through the inscriptions, what they wrote about themselves. And you read enough inscriptions and then you do get a picture. Yes, they are full of hyperbole. They are full of chest thumping. But if enough people say the same thing, you think there should be a nugget of truth in it. So this aunt that Mr. Paneer Selvan was talking about is a, a, a queen called Shembian Mahadevi. She was the wife of Uttama Chola, who was Raja Raja's uncle. Now, if you see Pony and Selvan, the, most of the story is around when Uta, the Uttama Chola is kind of portrayed as a scheming fellow who schemed his way to the kingship, edging aside Raja Raja because Raja Raja's brother was murdered. And then um, in, Raja Raja should have became, become the king, but Uttama became the king instead. So the, all the possible machinations behind that are what make up the story of Pony and Selvan. But through it all, Sembin Mahadevi was a queen. Uh, she, she was a queen to a king called Gandharaditya, who from all accounts was a, a pavam, as we call it. Like he was a pious fellow, quite unsuited to the brutal rigors of kingship. And he, the, the story is that he abdicated. He just kind of rose and went west, which either means that he died or he went off to somewhere and lived a quiet, pious life. For most women in any part of the world, at any stage in history, that would have meant the death knell. You know, she would have been, she was a widow. I mean, her husband was no longer king. She was nothing. But she hung on through multiple emperors. I think she was a woman, and it comes through in her inscription of great practical uh, intelligence. And when her son became the king, that's when she kind of came into her own. She commissioned tons of temples. And again, like Raja Raja, it was not just purely a religious sentiment that drove her, but a very practical intelligence. The temple in those times was the main institution in every Chola village. So it was a hub and center of village life. So to have a functioning temple that um, uh, that functioned well and that provided employment for a wi wide range of people was very important. And she saw the importance of that. The other thing is most Chola temples were built, made out of brick in the early days. They would crumble, they would fall to ruin. She had them converted into stone. And not only that, all the inscriptions that were there on the original brick temples, she had them re-inscribed on the new stone temples. And she also had a note made that these are the old inscriptions that have been re-inscribed 
So it's a, it's a woman with a thinking thing, you know, that she's thought through all this, that people should know that this is a temple that has been rebuilt with the inscriptions that have been re-transferred onto these walls. She commissioned new temples. I think it was thanks to her that the Lord Nataraja became the chief deity of the Chola Empire. She commissioned a lot of statues, bronze, um, the, the bronze idols came to their peak. I mean, the under her uh, patronage, actually, I think she patronized a bunch of bronze idol workshops and some of the best ones were made under her patronage. She also has inscribed about um, agriculture and about irrigation in her name. So she had a practical uh, intelligence too, because irrigation and agriculture were key things in the, in the Chola's prosperity, the Kaveri River, harnessing the water of that river, um, you know, the agriculture and irrigation there, they were all critical to the Chola uh, wealth, besides their war be beauty and everything like that. So from getting a pick, uh, just seeing the range of things that she was involved in and how she did it, I think she was a remarkable woman. And they say that Raja Raja might have stepped aside and allowed uh, Sembian Mahadevi's son Uttama to become king out of respect for her. And we do know that he had so much of respect for her that he has proclaimed Raja Raja in his inscriptions that any uh, announcements or inscriptions made by Sembian Mahadevi would hold the same weight as him. So that's the kind of uh, respect he had for her. So I think she was a remarkable woman and her statue was taken out. Her bronze image was taken out in procession, which is high honor in her own lifetime. This was done only to gods and the kings and maybe a few of the Nayanmar and Arvar saints. But for Sembian Mahadevi, a queen, a widow, you know, somebody who could have been sidelined to be given the same honor must speak of the high esteem in which she was held by her people. Now looking back, looking at the, your references, starting from Thiruvalangada bronzes to the inscription at uh, Leiden, yes. you have looked at multiple sources. What is the method you follow to harness these uh, multiple sources? So one wonderful thing I found was that all these inscriptions, so the Thiruvalangadu uh, grant is a copper plate grant that was made by Rajendra Chola. The laden plates that he talked about are another set of copper plate grants that were made by Raja Raja Chola, granting, you know, the, uh, the basically granting the revenues of a village to a particular temple. In the case of the laden grants, it was granting the revenues of a temple to, uh, of a village to a Buddhist vihara that was built by a, an Indonesian king, actually. So it shows a farsightedness on Raja Raja's part that he was allowing a foreign king and a foreign religion, a non-Shaiva religion to be supported. But all these inscriptions have been digitized and published in these volumes called the Epigraphia Indica. Now, at sometime in the 19th century, the field of in fields of Indology, Indian epigraphy, I think they started coming to life. And there's some amazing work done by people like uh, Venka, Rao Bahadur Venkaya, Eugene Hulsh, um, Krishna Shastri, and a bunch of European and Indian epigraphists who painstakingly went to these temples you know, uh, either got etchings of the uh, uh, inscriptions along their walls or they sat and wrote them down. And, you know, it was hard to understand. It's in a Tamil of an earlier era. So to figure out what was being said, for, for instance, one example is that people didn't in fact forgotten three or four centuries after Raja Raja that it was Raja Raja Chola who built the Brihadishwara temple. How do we know that? Because there's a manual of uh, the Tanjavur district brought out by the British who just mentioned, oh, there's this big temple called the Brihadishwara, which we think may have been built by some king called Kulatanga or some other name. It was not Rajaraja's name at all. And there was also a Stala Puranam or a mythological history of the temple that came out during the Nayak era, which were long and convoluted fable with, have, with no mention of Raja Raja at all. So Raja Raja had been forgotten about. You know, so it is these epigraphists who went there, deciphered, they kind of figured out the Tamil, they translated it. And the whole thing has been um, 
uh, translated, annotated, commented upon, and uh, put in English and Tamil, the original Tamil, the original Sanskrit, because large portions of it are in, Tam uh, in Sanskrit, and in English, and put on the web in these uh, in these uh, volumes called the Epigraphia Indica. They're big, big, big homes, and they're digitized and available online, and I found them entirely by choice. So again, you read through it, and then you see the uh, these uh, copper plate grants and inscri inscriptions, they start with a genealogy of of the Chola Empire. They'll say this Chola who came from the sun and then from the sun came so-and-so and from so-and-so and so came so-and-so. So there's a very, there's a kind of a mythological component followed by a semi-historical component followed by actual historical kings. So they trace their lineage. And if there are several copper plate grants that have these and each one is quite different, there's say 50% similarity but then each one will go off on a flight of fancy and have a different set of, uh, uh, you know, uh, names that they get, claim have, are the Chola ancestors. So what do you make of that? You realize that you do not take these literally, that this is the Chola way of proclaiming their greatness or proclaiming their great heritage. And as the years went on, their uh, inscriptions became ever more grandiose and ever more like uh, chest thumping kind of a thing. So these were their ways of proclaiming their greatness, as I said earlier. So you read the Tiruvallangadu grant, you read the Leiden grant, you see the differences, you see the, but the big picture is why did they say these things? And the other thing you get from the grants is the business, the nature of the business of the grant. So they will talk about the village. So you get an idea of life in Chola times. This village is being given to this temple, they will say. And then they'll describe the village, the dimensions of the village. What are the crops grown in that village? Who are the kind of people living in the village? So it's a kind of a real, you know, a snapshot into what life in that village look like. And then the procedures for the execution of that grant are also spelled out in detail. So they'll take a female elephant who, who will mark walk around the periphery of the temple to mark the, the boundary. So the and then the, uh, the whole bureaucracy that is in place to kind of uh, record this grant to make sure that the grant happens. So all, all this gives you an amazing window into Chola life. So I think those parts you can take for what they are, the earlier parts you take with a big dose of salt. See, again, it leads to a most interesting question. That is, you are getting quite a lot of bits. Yes. How did you put these bits together? Because there is a clear personalities. From these bits and pieces, how did you manage to build these personalities? It, it wasn't easy. I guess there were enough bits to uh, create a, a picture finally, like a jigsaw. You do have some pieces, you do have to fill in. I mean, this is, we're talking about events and personalities that happened a thousand years ago. So you have to put in some imagination. Uh, and I hope I'm right in whatever. I've tried to be as factual as possible. But there is a good deal of information, you know, so these inscriptions are tedious as anything. They're very, very, very boring. So you wade through all that and you do get a picture, you know, you read enough of it. And again, for scholars and researchers, uh, there is no substitute. There is no shortcut uh, in any of this. You just keep at it and at it and at it and a picture will emerge, you know. So you just have to keep both a close focus and like a, a a wider focus while while reading so it's it's uh... i think i'm going to open up so that students can ask questions uh it's open to all of you <laughs> generally they you can ask anything <laughs> yeah <laughs> And you're free to ask questions in Tamil. Yes. Yeah. And you, you know, in the course of your research, uh, my supposition is that uh, engineering and science, like you know, just the ability to build these large structures or uh, copper uh, refining or uh, these things uh, couldn't just come out in a single generation. So there must have existed a some kind of a long history or at least a 
few generations here, a few hundred year old uh, um, science and engineering already present. So did you find names of people who uh, names of uh, master engineers or master, uh, you know, people, metallurgy, uh, people, uh, you know, it's always like the king did it, you know, he did take, uh, uh, but you never see, whereas in Western culture, uh, you, you have uh, in the Renaissance or whatever, there's always the creator gets credit. Uh, um, and you, you always remember the creator and uh, of the actual actual creator is just you know lost lost to us so no we don't know who was the engineer or engineering mind or minds behind the brihadishwara temple and you're absolutely right that kind of expertise did not come out of uh, nowhere you know it just didn't come out of thin air uh, but we don't know how that how the process the evolution of that process we we do not know even bronze casting there must have been a ton of trial and error because in the pallavas that is when bronze casting actually started and there is a lot of uh, um, you know debate about the source of the copper for the for the bronze idols because there's no copper in the immediate vicinity so that is also something a source of uh, debate some people believe some scholars believe it came from sri lanka and uh, you need to, I think, each copper, depending on where it comes from, has a particular chemical signature. And getting museums and places to agree to have the, those ideas analyzed for that is, is quite a process. So the pro I, I no. So to answer your question, we do not have the names of any of the actual minds behind it. It was the, the king who kind of uh, got who wrote poems and poetry about the kings, those are there, but uh, not any of these other ones. No, good evening. Man. The questions everybody had, like, uh, it's just about thousand years, yeah? And uh, there is no motorized uh, vehicles or anything motorized or anything electrical. Uh, it's very difficult to imagine, you know, like in such a time, like how they build the stones, how did they cut it? You know, it takes 100 to 200 days to cut one big uh, stone, you know, and that's uh, mm, the common man can do it. He can, he can, I mean, 100 people can uh, break it, but my thing is, uh, how do they? Because the, all the temples are all only uh, one style, any temple, one style. And if there are 100, 200 stapatis or sculptors and involved, so they cannot do the same, like different painter comes with uh, different uh, paintings, you know. And one person can also cannot do because he, he takes about 60 to 70 years for one person, maybe more to build, you know. The style is same. Any temple you go, and how did they break the stones? How did they carry it? Even if you say there are elephants, you know, elephants cannot carry such big uh, boulders or things like that. If you get any information about it, please share. I think again, it's all just conjecture. So the Brihadeshwara temple, just talking about one temple, was built in about six years which is remarkable because you look at the cathedrals of Europe, the cathedral of Pisa, they built some, some of them over a couple of centuries also. So he must have just mobilized maybe his entire empire, like he's conquered Sri Lanka, he's conquered the tech, he's conquered Kerala, he's conquered all over. I'm sure they were all, you know, drawn into this colossus of a venture that he did and he made. There is no granite, the Bredishwara temple is made out of granite, there's no granite near Tanjavur, so they they, they assume it's quarried from you know about 50 60 miles away and like you said how do you bring it up either it was brought in coracles up the river or ferried on the backs of elephants so clearly manpower was not a problem for Raja Raja or these kings so they and the people had no choice they couldn't say I don't feel like doing this they must have all been forced into uh 
you know, doing this uh, thing. So, and like you said, there must have been thousands of sapatis, thousands of sculptors, thousands of just manual laborers c cutting the thing. You can, you can just imagine that. So, what what must have gone into it? And uh, and he must have cracked the whip on them because, as I said, this thing was started. They say in ten um oh four, and it was finished by ten ten. The the whole Brihadishwara. It's pretty remarkable. But there is nothing to tell us what the sweat and grime behind it was. All these poems are just eulogies, you know, this great thing it just happened like that and then, then it was completed. So there's nothing to document the, the actual process of it. We do not have that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Shastras are for the, uh, the bronze bronze images and all that. So. Stone also. Look, I have not read that. Mm -hmm. They did conduct, uh, consult the Agama Shastra, Shilpa Shastra, so the bronze and things, but I don't know the exact process that they used for this. So those also, I think you need to kind of they would not given have given the whole picture of the actual, as I said, sweat and grime. Mm -hmm. Okay, I should check it out. I have two questions. I'll yeah. keep them brief. One is I wanted to know uh, whether you had any information in the book about the Kerala and then entrance, which Rajaraja is supposed to have built after defeating the Keralites, and how it came to has come to be associated with Illa. That anybody entering through that entrance dies. Uh, uh, <laughs> that is that's one. Myth. Okay. Yes. And then the second one is that I've, I've recently come back from visiting a lot of the Hoysala temples in North Karnataka. Okay. And uh, two of them, particularly one in Talakadu, the Chennakesava Pirmal Temple, and uh, the one in uh, Halebid, um, were both built after the Hoysalas um, had victory over the Cholas. So do you touch up upon any of these wars or defeats of the Chola Empire in your book? Or can you give us a little bit more information? The Kerala, uh, Kerala Antika Gopuram is just mentioned. That's all. But I don't go into that much detail about it. And I think there's a photo of it in the book. As for the rumor that, you know, somebody who dies, it, it's, I, I have not. So I've tried to keep it to dry history and uh, I have not touched upon that. And yes, the Hoysalas were both friends and enemies of the Cholas in later dates. So I've written about some of the battles in the book, but not any of those temples. So because that is more like from the Hoysala point of view. So the Hoysalas are mentioned as friends and enemies of the Cholas because they initially helped them against other rivals, the Pandyas and other rival powers. And then they turn their backs on them later on. And uh, so there's, there's a bit of that. So. Any other questions? Yes. How much, did, uh, how much did information about the Cholas outside the region? How much did you find, uh, you know, how much, how valuable were those in forming your perspective about uh, what you wrote over here? You mean outside the immediate Chola? Outside, yeah. You, you've relied a, a lot on the inscriptions of the region. Were there any inscriptions or any kind of material that you found about the Cholas outside the region that helped inform your perspective? Uh, yes. Yeah. So the Chola's biggest enemies were the Pandyas. So I do read, so if there's a battle, say, between the Cholas and the Pandyas, I read the inscriptions that the Pandyas wrote about the same battle. And it's kind of funny because each one will claim they won the battle. Each one will claim that they, they chopped off the head of the, the Pandya or Chola reader. So again, you, you know, um, but then you see the acid test of an, a battle or a region have actually having been won is that the inscriptions of that emperor appear in that region. They can say what they want, they can say they want it, but if there is an inscription that appears in that region, say an, a Chola, an inscription by a Chola emperor that appears in the Pandya region, that is the only way you know that they have actually conquered that, that region. So you again look at these inscriptions, outside the Chola thing to see where they have inscribed, when it happens. So that's how these historians are, have also created a chronology, you know, because as I said, they were grand at image building and publicity and public relations and chest thumping. But 
how much to actually find out if what they were saying was true is to read the one is to read the other side's account and also to see where these inscriptions have been found so yes you do need to read other histories too and uh, uh, that that was definitely part of my research madam i have a small question yes very much is known about uh, raja raja's birth but very little is known about the raja raja's death there appears to be some mystery the barajas i know they who undertook some archaeological excavation they did not relate the report after excavation was carried out do you have anything to say about that i don't have so i'm trying very hard to find out so that's a very interesting aspect actually so there is a little village i think called udayalur in which somebody found a half buried lingam in a shed in the middle of a field and for whatever reason they decided this was raja raja's um a memorial shrine or a, um a, the, this was where his remains were buried and there was a great deal of excitement and they kind of everybody they put up a sign and said this is raja raja's final resting place but as i said there is no proof one way or the other the archaeological survey of india was told to come in and they said we are going to do a survey and use drones and do some some sort of thing and this was before the pandemic the latest i could find i think was dated 2019 and they said we are going to release a report but i could not find any updated information on that at the same time there is another gentleman i think is professor devanayaka is his name he is a professor of chola history he says that is not raja raja that half buried lingam in the shed in the middle of the field is not raja raja's burial place but in that same village there is a temple and uh, that temple is where raja raja is buried and he cites a variety of reasons in fact i have written about that in the book in my epilog as to why he feels that is raja raja's final uh, burial place or just his memorial shrine and not the lingam in the middle of the field so he has also said please come and do a survey survey this place as well and let us see so that is it's all hanging in the air right now so this professor devanayagam believes that that lingam in the shed might actually be the burial or the memorial place for raja raja's murdered brother aditya karikala because he says the way the, the direction that lingam is facing and other signs show that this was erected for a person who died an unnatural death which and raja raja's brother was murdered so he says it could be his burial place and raja raja's was in this kailashnatha temple a few like maybe a kilometer or two away so if it's all this is true it's fascinating that the two brothers were laid to rest so close to each other but it's as yet an unsolved mystery so there's so much we still don't know about the cholas there's so much yet to be learned and uh, i think so that that is ongoing you know the research and uh, excavations many more inscriptions to be uh, uh, deciphered and uh, i'm in time i'm sure we'll get more information about the cholas all the fifteen wife and husband i have mentioned the wives <laughs> yes there's a bunch of them and again these wives were acquired it's kind of sad to say it but they were like political their pawns you know so you kind of uh, cast your net wide for uh, friendship like you, how, how do you secure uh, uh, loyalty and alliance allies and stuff you get your guess are married to some daughter from there and then they have no choice but to you know become your loyal ally because you wouldn't want to fight against your own daughter right so so this marrying multiple women from multiple uh, clans and tribes and even dynasty was a way of securing a loyalty and uh, yeah so there is some mention of that there as well so that is spoken about the costumes dresses based on the uh -huh. no deepika into the mic please uh, deepika <laughs> so they usually speak about the social political and religious aspect but in depth if you see we have numerous paintings in the pallava tem uh, the chola temple and have we concentrated on the dressing style or the ornament specifically I'm not yeah. really unfortunately because i felt it is those paintings are in such poor condition 
it would be kind of meaningless. I, I, I mean, I just felt maybe you could get a line or two. So I just kind of left that aside, you know, so that it's, uh, unfortunately, it's more about the battles. And there's a lot about the, 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 the religious movements, the temples, his trade missions, the trade that they did, you know, so that is all like solid facts, I guess, that we have. How Rajaraja organized his empire and uh, the land surveys that he did, that is all covered. So I kind of stuck to whatever I felt comfortable writing about. I felt comfortable that I had enough verifiable information. Again, I'm not a historian, so I just kind of piggyback off all the work that historians had already done, and that made sense to me. And uh, but that's that's what I wrote about. Maybe textile history? No, no textile history, no. Uh, I get there's just a mention that their silks were coveted, that they, they were part of the trade and stuff, but no, that was not the focus, uh, really. So, uh, I mean, this as much as I've written, I could write a whole book on what I've not written. So, <laughs> just stop at some point. And, uh, yes, please. Want to come, ma'am? ஒருங்கிங் <laughs> Rajaraja was after and our uh, ports and the trade is very important and the angindu uh, to the west and east nariya boats and the ships that conducted trading in both directions so other captured panathukku avarku uh, romba important and the so one of his first first military victory in the kandaru sare and the angindu they found inscriptions that showed it was a very violent attack on on this place அந்த இடம் என்ன சொல்ல முடியாது சில பேர் சொல்ற இட் இஸ் இட் இஸ் மிலிட்ரி ஸ்கூல் அதெல்லாம் எழுதியிருக்கேன் என்னன்னா ஆனா அந்த இடத்துல ஒரு வெரி வெரி வயலண்ட் பெரிய பேட்டில் இருந்தது அண்ட் ஒரு வயலண்டா ஒரு விக்டரி வந்தது ராஜா அது அதுதான் நம்மளுக்கு டெஃபினட்டா தெரியும் தேங்க்யூ ஃப்ரம் தி லைப்ரேரியன்ஸ் பாயிண்ட் ஆஃப் வியூ யூ ஹவ் செட் தட் யூ டிட் டிட் நாட் ஃபைண்ட் மெட்டீரியல்ஸ் ஆன் सर्टेन एरियाஸ் ரைட் சோ வாட் இஸ் யுவர் டேக் ஆன் வாட் ஷட் பீ டன் to do the future research and what areas have you laid like down certain areas where people can do research in these areas to find- research being done already so but some of it is very very in very specialized areas and it's not accessible to the public so my research was limited to that which i could easily get you know that was available in in the public domain and i'm sure again that this i could write a whole book on what was not <laughs> covered in this but, but uh, online resources are fantastic this roja mutaya library has a lot of stuff i mean as i said i started my research here so there is information here but the, there's a website called archive.org which has remarkable stuff i mean that was my absolute godsend in in that so uh, but again i'm not a scholar i'm not a historian so there must be a lot that i missed out on and i think there's academic work being done in very very specific areas like you asked you know about the copper and 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 the the engineering skills of the people like you asked all that kind of stuff is being researched upon and uh, but it's not easily accessible so one aspect which comes to our mind is coexistence versus primacy of a single religion and around the time of the later chola we see the saivism becoming the dominant religion and the idea of coexistence yes being subjected to severe strain what are the documents you managed to get about this strain about coexistence again there are inscriptions where as you said saivism was the dominant religion 
But I think there was in one of the later Chola kings, there was a violent sort of a quarrel or disagreement between a Chola emperor and the followers of Ramanaja, for instance. And they feel that one emperor was killed, Ati Rajendra was his name. His, he ruled for only maybe a few weeks. And they feel that he, he might have been killed either by the fellow who became the next king or by the followers of Ramanuja, Ramanuja who were insulted by what by his views on Vishnu. Apparently, he threw some statue of Vishnu into the sea, and you know he was so shy white that he would not allow anything else in in his kingdom. So it was an interesting evolution of uh, you know from the early days when Jainism, Buddhism, and a nascent Shaivism it was coming into being right before the Cholas came to the consolidation and solidification of Shaiva worship, but also the acceptance of other religions. You know, as I said earlier, uh, Raja Raja Chola uh, endowed the, uh, the revenues of one village to a, a Buddhist Vihara in Nagapatinam. And that Buddhist Vihara had built, been built by a king from Indonesia, the Sri Vijaya king, whose traders were coming to Nagapatinam to trade with the Cholas. And they wanted a place to worship for their uh, religion. So he built this uh, Buddhist uh, shrine over there. And Raja Raja said, okay, I will help you maintain that shrine. And the village of the, uh, the revenues of this village called Ane Mangalam will be given to, for you to maintain this. And a later uh, Chola king continued that. And these are recorded in what are known as the Leiden grants that are now in Leiden University in, in the Netherlands. So there was a time of, kind of tolerance, you know, okay, yeah, you do your religion, I'll do my religion, but it seems to have become more rigid. And I guess that's how societies evolve also, you know, when uh, then this Shaivism became a very big thing and uh, uh, and a king might have paid for his life with that. And it's inscriptions that tell you this, that again, that give you little nuggets that you kind of create a story out of. Sages are so small, like your side of this. Why do you want to build such a big temple? Because nobody inhabited it. And people say a lot of gold was there. Yeah. So that's why all the Muslim kings attacked. Well, they didn't attack. Yes, they attacked because they knew there was a lot of wealth in these temples and they came down seeking wealth. I mean, everybody was seeking wealth, the Muslim kings, Hindu kings, all of them were after, you know, wealth. So this is not a Hindu versus Muslim thing, but so they buried a lot of their idols underground, knowing that the, there were invasions coming from North India and that the, the idols would probably be desecrated. And it's interesting because, you know, they were buried using very specific rituals underground and only certain people knew where these idols were, 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 were buried. By the time the Islamic invasions ended and the, you know that period of history was over, it was, it was over 75 or 100 years, people had died, people forgot where these images were, uh, idols were buried. And to this day, they're digging up idols. It's kind of very fascinating in fields and stuff like that. Uh, and that those idols, some of them have become part of the idol smuggling uh, route. It's it's really, really sad, actually. People, idols are being substituted for fake ones, newly made ones, and smuggled off somewhere. So it, this is all part of the Chola story, actually. You know, But that is at the end of the Chola Empire, actually. After the Cholas faded out was when the Muslim Islamic invasions came south. But those same idols that were made in Chola times were buried underground. So a lot of the idols that are used today in those temples were built, uh, made in Vijayanagara times, actually. There are very few original Chola idol, idols still in worship. See, when we talk about Muvendars, Pallavas are remembered as Sangam literature. Cholas are the only people who have left this concrete Bhagadishwara and the bronzes and everything else. Because Chera again comes through uh, Garam, which is essentially a literary imagination. And the only concrete imagination is from Chola. Yes. So did it play any role in you deciding to write on Raja Raja and not on, say, any of the Pandya king or Chera king? Yes, 
But to be honest, I wrote about Raja Raja because I was asked to write about that. So that was my publisher's mandate. He said, write a book on Raja Raja. So that's what I did. But I'm glad I did because, uh, you know, as I researched and as I found out more, you realize what a larger than life figure he was and what an impact he has made in, uh, you know, in the history of the region and the history of our country also. So, uh, and the Cholas, as I said, inscribed their, their, their inscriptions stood out in two ways. One is the sheer number of inscriptions that they left and also the quality of the inscriptions. So Raja Raja kind of tried to standardize his inscriptions by adding a portion where he kind of laid out his, in a chronological fa uh, fashion all his achievements. So that, again, of course, you know that there's hyperbole, there's exaggeration, there's, you know, self-praise and all that, but it's something you have that as, uh, and you know that it is Raja Raja because previously you didn't know which king wrote what, you know, they all had the same names. The dating protocols were not known. So Raja Raja really, I feel he had a sense of history, you know, and way in the way he conducted, went about things and the way he built his kingdom and administered his kingdom. There was a sense of a, a, a big picture. So every now and then there comes a king who is like, who is a Jupiter, you know, he stands out amongst everybody else. And Raja Raja was definitely one of those. And I'm happy I got to write about him. So <laughs> I'll take one more question before we wrap up. Good evening, ma'am. Yes. Uh, as a history student, we uh, personally, I often confuse between the mythology and the historical uh, events in history. Now, um, when Pragdeshwara Temple, there are many mythological stories that come from the temple. For example, the huge Nandi statue is a prominent mythological story. In your research, you have a question. In, in the particular mythological story, that's a very interesting question. Um, let me think. See, it won't be entirely fake. Uh, I'm, straight, I'm going blank right now. Uh, <laughs> Okay, but before I think about a story, I mythological stories in the book, because again, I think that gives you our thinking, every stories and chodra, every think and the thought process level idea kadikir the number in the Madri stories, this must be the kind of people that they are, because stories give you an insight into their psychology, into their mindset, into what they thought about themselves, into how they wanted people to think about them. So mythology is very important. Number two, the stories in Cholita, you cannot shove that aside. But on question, I can't think of one story that I feel might have come out of, uh, I'm just going totally blank. Uh, uh, right now. So uh, there is a story in the, uh, the beginning of the book called the movie and there are about the three dynasties, Ch uh, Cheras, Pandyas and Cholas. I, they came out of the mind of Shiva to vanquish a very evil king. And the Cholas went to the Kaveri Delta and started their empire. Pandyas went to Madurai and started their empire. Start panna. Cheras West, le, Kerala, le, our empire started. So maybe there is a nugget of truth in this. Urvala, there was a, an evil king that Ivalan joined Pandya. Uh, uh, the, his name is Sali Vahana. Uh, our defeat Panita, they started their kingdoms. Maybe there is some truth that out of which the story sprang. You know, so, but I don't know. Show nobody other. Okay, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, in order to doubt, in the title, Padika Mode, King of Kings, Abdin Rikke, uh, Adala Paka Mode, normal, actually, Nano, you know, book particular. Well, here in the Paka Mode, one day, Kandipa, Avroda, Ella, victories, you know, uh, Ella Mudunjala, Evlo, Factual, Iruka Mudimo, and the Avroda, Perimical Ella, May, Sona Madri, and a Ton, it's other, you know, particular, well, here in the Paka Mode, uh, either or negative things, Sola Mudima. Oh, negative nare because because every human being has negative and positive. So just to Raj Raj was the greatest king. He was kind. He was generous. He was compassionate. He was this Adamatran Chana. It is actually doing him a disservice. He was very um, ruthless. 
ஆரோ அவரை இன்சல்ட் பண்ணினா உடனே ஒரு ஆர்மி அனுப்பிட்டு apparently aro uh, his uh, diplomatic envoy was uh, insulted al kova patte he he got furious and he sent an army and uh, you know he waged a war against that similarly he must have been he was very uh, generous in that you know i think he took good care of the the temple when women and all that but he also was greedy he wanted everybody's territory you know so adu uh, irundathu he was a, a very devoted man but there is a lot of treachery involved his backstabbing involved in running a kingdom our he invaded sri lanka and about the sri lankan chronicles it can the invasion patti apparently it was brutal and he just destroyed the city of anuradhapura it was so badly destroyed that it could no longer be the capital of the lanka mandalam but they changed it to pollanuruva so he must have been a very cruel man and a very difficult man <laughs> and a brutal man but also a man of great vision and i think all people have this combination of good and bad in different uh, kind of proportions so thank you ma'am ma'am one last question ma'am ipo irukka political situation la oru oru common theory one irukadhu vandha na anga kelvi patrukom என்ன அப்படின்னா அங்க அந்த பிரகதீஸ்வரா டெம்பிள் கட்டும் போது நிறைய சர்வன்ஸையும் நிறைய பேரை வந்து அங்க கொண்டுட்டதாகவும் அதனால ஒரு பொசிஷன்ல இருக்கக்கூடிய ஒரு கிரேட் பொசிஷன்ல இருக்கக்கூடிய ஒருத்தர் அங்க வந்து ஃப்ரெண்ட் ஓர் வழியா போக மாட்டாங்கன்ற ஒரு மிஸ்கன்செப்ஷனா இல்ல நார்மல் தியரியானு தெரியல அது இருக்கு அது உண்மையா மேம் இல்ல அதை பத்தி நீங்க என்ன நினைக்கிறேன் Okay, one last question, yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, there are many myths around the Cholas, especially yes. when we speak about the Cholas. We know more about the Cholas. As you said, many have researched about the Cholas. But still many mysteries and myths follow the Cholas, especially the temple. Yes. Like she said, there is one myth and there is either the Nandi Valandhitrik, a print or myth. And uh, they also say that one stone, the shadows doesn't Correct. fall. Shadow there are many, fall. many number of myths around that temple. Mm. so why is that happening why this particular dynasty or particular king or particular this temple especially it uh, falls under lots of myths <laughs> it's an interesting question i think when something is so grand and great it kind of lends in it lends itself to this kind of storytelling and myth making and 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 things like that so it is just the na- human nature that if it's some so small like it's insignificant thing why would we bother you know so i Uh, when something is there this big and grand it's just i think it lets our imagination run wild first of all the nandi was not built in raja raja's time it was built much later and the whole shadow thing is false because they, there is a shadow so it's i think some work of human nature that uh, uh, we look at something huge and think there's got to be a lot of uh, i don't know if raja raja or the cholas themselves kind of encourage this kind of uh, thing i know they encourage a lot of uh, hyperbole and things like that so uh, maybe this is some some offshoot of that actually nandi is grown in karnataka no? uh-huh. they have a groundnut festival in gandhi vidhya groundnut groundnut festival okay. so there you have biggest nandi the teller story it was growing and growing and, and women got a lot of money came it's in karnataka no சேல் it's right outside thank you, thank you.